Coming up on Energy TV, we explore a sustainable future. We really need to look at technology and innovation as a, w a means to produce uh, unconventional gas, oil sands resources economically and also make sure that they are sustainable, that they would minimize the environmental footprint. We talk about the potential of biomass. We don't have much sun in the winter. Right, so if we're going to see solar come in, it's going to be in Arizona and Utah and New Mexico, not in Alberta. But we have lots of biomass. And we give you investment tips in wealth creation. following is brought to you by Halliburton. Halliburton, from Canada, for Canada. So welcome to Energy TV. I'm Helena DeVries. I'm coming to you from Art Point in Calgary and behind me an exhibit of the early days of the oil and gas industries. Now these photographs were garnered from the provincial archives as well as the Glenbow Museum. Now of course in today's energy market to ensure sustainability you need to have effective and technological approaches. Here's more in this story. The corporate climate has dictated many changes in the business and economic structure. The energy sector is no different. It was from 60s to the early years in 2000 that through uh, innovation and technology development, uh, the industry was able to reduce the cost significantly to the point that the uh, oil sands projects were economic. The low oil price has now made some resource methods in places like the oil sands uneconomical, says the Petroleum Technology Alliance Canada president. So now it's a matter of looking towards reaching a sustainable future. We really need to look at technology and innovation as a, w a means to uh, produce uh, unconventional gas, oil sands resources economically and also make sure that they are sustainable, that they would minimize the environmental footprint. PTAC says it's pursuing eco-efficiency projects that reduce greenhouse gas emissions at the same time reducing costs. Projects like converting waste heat from compressors to energy and CO2 sequestration. Asgurpur believes the industry needs to collaborate more rather than using the technology and processes as financial leverage. Collaboration is not just about financial leveraging, it's about uh, working together to provide a better product. When you have 15 companies uh, working together and sharing expertise and knowledge, the expertise leveraging could be very significant. Eddie Isaacs of the Alberta Energy Research Institute believes it's very important for industry and all levels of government to focus on innovation and to also understand the changing landscape in order to stay ahead of the curve. The world is also changing where renewables are coming into the picture. So it's very, very important for us to understand uh, the energy future, uh, the demand for energy uh, is not going to decrease, it's probably going to increase over time and we certainly need to know how the province can move forward to a more sustainable future. Isaac stresses that the industry doesn't have to reinvent itself, rather take the technologies and adapt them accordingly. But we don't have to reinvent it, uh, we can just simply take it and say here is the feedstock we've got, here are the issues we've got, you know, they're surround the issues are about water uh, use, uh, fresh water use, it's about CO2 emissions, it's about emissions of concerns uh, that, that people have, and it's about land, land, land reclamation. So all of these issues, I think, can be addressed uh, by looking at what are the options for new technologies. Isaacs also stresses that a sustainable future must have a disciplined approach where solutions are adopted on a stage-by-stage -stage basis, where it is today and where it can go in the future. Chad Carrier, Energy TV. So alternative energy sources have long been on the minds of many. Now in this next story, we take a look at biomass and how those in the industry believe that the technology is ready. Now it's just a matter of execution. Here's more. For a majority of people, this crop represents agriculture and food. 
For the energy sector, it signifies a renewable energy source in the form of biomass. Lignol cellulosic ethanol is a process of turning plant stock into ethanol. Cellulose and lignin make up straw, corn stalks, wood, etc. And, and this really is the promise. It's got very high energy yield and it allows you to put marginal, crop, marginal land into purpose-grown crops that have a high plant yield without a high fertilizer consumption. Flynn is quick to point out that biomass is different than using grain as an ethanol source, as he believes competition with food sources is a negative mix. When it comes to other renewable energies like wind and solar in the Canadian market, Flynn does admit that they have significant benefits, but compared to biomass, they're limited. We don't have much sun in the winter, right? So if we're going to see solar come in, it's going to be in Arizona and Utah and New Mexico, not in Alberta. But we have lots of biomass. We have lots of straw and we have lots of wood. Now when you get to wind, wind is wonderful, but it's not reliable. So you can only have a certain percentage of wind generating power. Flynn believes research will help the processes, but it's not the answer. Taking action is, as the technology is ready and existing. We don't need to go out and spend lots of money on research. Research can always make us smarter. But if it's used to delay action, it would be wrong because you can make transportation fuels out of biomass today and you can make electricity out of biomass today. And this is being done at a commercial scale in the world. Biomass production is happening in places like the United States and Finland, which is home to the world's largest wood-burning power plant. It's not food to ethanol, it's the stalk. And the United States commissioned six commercial scale plants by giving them some help. A couple of them have fallen off the rails, some of them are going ahead, including a Canadian technology called Iogen that's going to be implemented in Idaho. So don't tell me this can't be done, other people were doing it. Of course, Flynn adds that biomass is not going to be less expensive than fossil fuels creating a dilemma of who will pay for the more expensive, although greener, energy form. Flynn does add that not all biomass technologies are created equal, meaning there are more cost-effective solutions, like turning straw into electricity, as opposed to manure. Like technology, Flynn also believes that some policies are better than others when it comes to implementing biomass. But it's a learning process he is hoping to see progress. One problem with Alberta's policy is it rewards small plants more than big plants. Uh, a second concern I have is that it uses a, uh, an upfront payment rather than spreading the payment out over time. Uh, and I think other jurisdictions have done a slightly better job. We're all feeling our way to the right way to do this. Chad Carrier, Energy TV. Now, an interesting point about that story is that Dr. Peter Flynn believes that Alberta is actually set to lead the pack when it comes to the effective use of biomass. Now, coming up after the break, we tell you why one man believes hydrogen is actually the missing energy link. More on that when we return. If we're going to stop the CO2, which we better stop, uh, you have to get to currencies, a chemical currency and electronic currency which don't emit any CO2. And the only chemical currency that's really available out there is hydrogen. For geologists, for search, hike, and rescue, or for homeland security, there is now an enabling technology that in your backpack you can carry with you a solar generator that is silent, easy to use, and, and works around, around the world. Portions of this program are brought to you by Niblack Mining. This section brought to you by June Warren Publishing, Nichols Energy Group. So welcome back to Energy TV. We're coming to you from Art Point in Calgary and an oil and gas exhibit that chronicles the early days of the oil and gas industry in southern Alberta. Earlier in the show, we talked about biomass as an effective alternative form of energy. Now in this next story, we talk about hydrogen and what that means to the energy puzzle. Here's more. 
much like the pace of this traffic, the competition for alternative energy sources powering the future is fierce. There's solar and wind power that get a lot of coverage, but what about hydrogen energy? David Sanborn Scott is a major proponent of the energy method and its potential. It's hard to, to, to other than say that it's the most important new energy currency coming along. As mentioned by Scott, energy currency is a point to take note of when talking about hydrogen. In the future will have to be the two energy currencies. Remember that neither electricity or hydrogen is an energy source. You have to have sources to make it from. They will have to dominate our, our energy system in a deeper future, which let's say is at least maybe 100 years from now, 70 years from now. Hydrogen derives energy needed to power certain things like automobiles, planes and oil sands processes in an environmentally friendly way. Scott says one of the first uses of the method is tether hydrogen. In other words, to integrate non-fossil energy with fossil energy, and in this case it's the oil sands, and uh, to make them cleaner and to make them get the processing more efficient. And then in the longer haul, of course, we'll use it as the the kerosene, we use kerosene to fly airplanes. According to Sanborn Scott, understanding the impact of hydrogen and the fact that it can mobilize other energy sources like wind and solar is the missing link. It's not setting apart from, from wind and solar, it's now you can use solar, which we can now use to either keep your house warm or to make electricity, but how do you use solar to fly an airplane? So you use solar and harvest it to make hydrogen and then you fly the airplane on the hydrogen. Some criticisms of hydrogen are that it's expensive, but Sanborn Scott doesn't see it that way. He does admit that it may be a little more expensive energetically, but it does have storage potential. We can make hydrogen now, just hydrogen alone, from steam, methane, or farming, probably cheaper than we make gasoline. Now, I'm not saying that that's the way we'll do it in the future, and there are other costs like liquefaction so that you can store it and those sorts of things. Sanborn Scott believes it's not the technologies, it's understanding the importance of hydrogen that is important today and moving forward. He says the technologies are already developed to create hydrogen, meaning it is realistic today. If we're going to stop the CO2, which we better stop, uh, you have to get to currencies, a chemical currency and electronic currency which don't emit any CO2. And the only chemical currency that's really available out there is hydrogen. Chad Carrier, Energy TV. There's a lot of competition among manufacturers in the solar energy industry these days. And with rapidly improving technology, the focus is always on who can make the product better and less expensive. Global Solar Energy has evolved over the years to become a major producer of thin film solar cells, whose many applications have set the company apart. We deposit on a thin film foil the photovoltaic cell. It's in a very elaborate process that, that does a deposition in a vacuum chamber batch to batch. When we get the cell out, it comes out in 3,000 square feet and we cut it up into individual cells in order that we can build up the voltage to make the different solar products that, that the designer wants to make. This thin film material is enabling producers to manufacture products never seen before in the solar industry, such as solar shingles on a roof or solar siding on a building. Global Solar is also breaking new ground with its flexible, foldable, portable solar charges. For geologists, for search, hike and rescue, or for Homeland Security, there is now an enabling technology that in your backpack you can carry with you a solar generator that is silent, easy to use, and, and works around, around the world. According to the company, the technology has the ability to cross over into various other areas, even vacations. So any of us with our electronic devices, whether it be a Blackberry, a phone, or an iPod, can go out into the mountains and we can still communicate like we like to today without being disabled because we're not near a plug-in. So we have a really great advantage because we can supply material to standard industry, but we also can change the market by creating alternate products of energy that were not there before. And in addition, serve a smaller niche of markets 
that really actually has a need, whether you're a soldier in the field, Hello. Uh, 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 police uh, on the street, or a uh, vacationer going for a canoe trip. So basically, Global Solar says it's working to make solar products accessible to everyone. Really where we should be putting solar is back to the rooftop. We've seen this progression from the rooftop out to the solar fields, but now we're seeing the uh, tariffs and stipends bringing solar back to the rooftop. It has a couple advantages, is it creates microgrids that are easy to distribute for the energy companies, but it also gives every person an enabling technology for the security of energy that they wish they had. So this thin film, because of its lower cost and its application potential, will enable those kind of markets, which have been really difficult putting solar glass on an existing structure. And interesting to note, business is booming for Global Solar. The company has actually expanded its manufacturing facility in Tucson, Arizona, and added another one in Germany. Now, coming up after the break, we talk about wealth creation tips for small business owners in wealth creation. Stay with us. Wealth Creation 101, brought to you by Investors Group Financial Services, Inc. Talk to us about how the plan by Investors Group can help you fulfill your plans for life. CPAC, Canada's oil and gas entrepreneurs, invite you to their Junior Oil and Gas Investor Showcase. This free day-long event sponsored by ATV Financial is your chance to learn about investing opportunities with some of Canada's most exciting junior oil and gas companies. Join CPAC along with Energy TV at the Westin Calgary Monday, June 15th, 2009 at 9.30 a.m. So welcome back to Energy TV. Of course, everyone can use some investment advice these days and financial planning advice as well. Small business owners are no exception. And perhaps what's even more important than investment advice is what you're doing with your taxes. Here's more from Shafiq Harani in Wealth Creation. Wealth Creation is brought to you by Investors Group and Shafiq Harani. Welcome to Wealth Creation. Joining us, as always, is Shafi Karani, Division Director at Investors Group Financial Services, Inc. He's the number one financial advisor in Canada at Investors Group, according to New Business Credits. Shafiq, as always, thanks again for coming on the show. Thanks again for having me, Chad. So every week, we're here to put Shafiq on the spot when it comes to investment advice. Now, a fair amount of your practice is made up of small business owners. Yes. So when it comes to investing, what's a strategy for small business investing? Uh, okay, well, the first thing you have to look at is what attracts small business owners, what they're looking for. And most business owners are looking for a number of things. One, tax. I mean, the, one of the biggest mistakes people make is tax. Yeah, you know, they they try to say, well, I'll save money if I can pay off my mortgage. I'll save money if I can reduce my grocery bill or my utility bill. Well, 40% of what we make goes to taxes. So the first thing you got to look at taxes. Alternatively, another invest, what they look for is um, how to credit approve my business, how to get money out of my small business on a tax efficient basis. Do I dividend sprinkle? Do I, do I pay out corporate earnings? So how do small businesses effectively uh, increase their cash flow? So sometimes, you know, a small business will make some money and then they spend it. It goes to certain things like taxes and just certain other overhead costs. But how can a small business effectively invest? Okay. Well, the first thing we have to do, again, is go back to our taxes. So if we look at how we're taxed as individuals, if I'm an employee, I'm taxed at a certain rate. So here in Alberta, I'm taxed at, let's say, 40%. So if I make 100 grand, I pay 40 grand taxes, I'm left with $60,000. The taxation for small businesses is a little bit different in, in Alberta, and I'll just show you a quick calculation. If you had 100000 bucks in your earnings or revenue, what's called active business revenue from your business, you're going to pay still the 38% tax bracket, but the small business, the federal government gives you what's called a 10% abatement so the provinces can levy their own taxes. That brings your federal tax rate down to 28%. Now, if you're earning what's called active business income. Active business income, you get what's called a small business deduction. And that deduction is 16%. So you get a 16% deduction on a certain amount of income. That brings your tax rate down to 12%. Then the provinces levy their own taxes. Now in Alberta, again, the provincial tax rate is 3% plus surtaxes, which adds up to about 4%. 
that gives you 16% tax on active business income. So if I make 100 grand as an, as an employee, I pay 30, 40,000 dollars in taxes. I make 100 grand as a small business owner, I pay 20, 16,000 dollars in taxes. That extra money can be invested. The problem is you must invest it in the right structure of investments. So there's a structure of investments called a corporate class structured investments. These investments grow tax sheltered, and that's how you grow tax deferred investments, and you invest them through your corporation. Well, Shafiq, always interesting. Thanks, Jeff. And as Shafiq mentioned also, that was an Alberta case study, so this will vary across different provinces yes, and territories. You bet. All right, so for more information on Shafiq Karani and the wealth creation segment, log on to energytv.com. Well, that's this episode of Energy TV. To view some of these amazing photographs of the early days of the oil and gas industry in Alberta, log on to soulofalberta.com. So we'll see you next week. And of course, you can always catch our show online at energytv.com. And while you're there, drop us an email with your questions or comments. And of course, check back often for updates on hot topics. And you want to link on to the energy news for updates on the day-to-day -day activities of the oil and gas industry. We thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. So coming up next week on Energy TV, it's an episode you don't want to miss. Energy TV is hosting a special half-hour panel discussion with strategic thinkers in the oil and gas industry. It's no surprise the economy is in the midst of a serious recession and the oil and gas industry is reeling. To offer some insight and guidance, we've assembled a distinguished panel of oil and gas legends to talk about the issues affecting the sector. You don't want to miss this special half-hour candid forum discussion. Join us Saturdays at 11, Sundays at noon on Global, or always online at Energy tv.com this program brought to you by real investments tv.com we don't have much sun in the winter right so if we're going to see solar come in it's going to be in arizona and utah and new mexico not in alberta but we have lots of biomass we have lots of straw and we have lots of wood good we're done